We lose people all the time. It's just the nature of the job. What can you expect from a place full of nooks and crannies people intentionally go to get lost in? I usually don't worry when I don't see someone for a while, but when it's been days since someone's checked out, it's usually a sign that I need to step in. I'm not doing this alone, thankfully. No librarian is ever truly alone, are they? I have help from the watchers and listeners of the shows. Thanks to them. It usually doesn't take long to get the scent, if you know what I mean. However, today is one of the rare and unfortunate exceptions when my search has exceeded more than an hour, and an hour is pushing it. I've been searching and asking around for almost six hours, scouring shelves and listening for the telltale breeding. The watchers have their quadrants, so it's much like playing hot and cold. Bad news, one says, and my brain shivers in my skull, both from its existence and its statement. They cross the tape, says the watcher, and I groan. Are you sure? My stomach still drops at the thought. Even though I've been doing this a very long time, long enough that I remember every book on every shelf better than my own child's face, but knowing a poor soul lost themselves beyond the tape, I grieve for them. The watcher doesn't speak, but generates an affirmative sensation. That means I have to backtrack to my desk for supplies. I thank them, asking that they send word ahead of my arrival. It's been a while since I've had to go past the tape, which means it's been a while since I entered the broom closet. The helmet is dusty. It looks almost like it's from one of those old-fashioned scuba diving suits. It's not nearly so heavy, though. There's a bright lamp affixed to the front just above the visor, but it's as much of a hindrance as a help. While most of the time, those beyond the tape know not to bother me. Some still get bored enough to try, and the lamp acts like a beacon. I don't blame them. It's what prisoners do. Find the weakest among them and test their mettle. I've got a sack full of non-perishables, tinctures, aspirin, and a compass, not like the kind you're used to, but would take too long to explain. And time is of the essence, so I'll let your imagination handle it from here. I sling the sack across my body and fasten my waist with a utility belt that would make a trust fun back character with abandonment issues jealous. It's got floss, lighters, matches, and a few more tools that don't exist outside of the library. The last thing I grab is a flamethrower. This is where I should be very transparent with you. I'm not actually the librarian. I'm the librarian's assistant. I know. Isn't that just your luck, right? Not to worry. I'm very good at using this thing, and it does the job nicely. Whatever job I may deem necessary at any particular moment. But the head librarian doesn't really need much of anything to ward off what lingers here. I don't know exactly where he is at the moment, nor do I want to know. If this were a real pickle, I would summon him. But while a rare occasion, it's not unusual in the scope of a thousand years. After all, no one comes here without the intention, whether it's conscious or subconscious, to get lost. It's the nature of this place. But you know that, don't you? It's why you're here, after all. It doesn't take me long to find the tape, which is fortuitous. Sometimes it moves around, but the watchers and listeners kept a beat on it this time, so as to direct me. Yes, it is really dark. Yes, it's literal tape. Hazard tape, but that's almost like a beacon to the adventurous, isn't it? I think the library knows that. It's greedy, but it's also quite discerning in taste. In some circles, that means that I should extend congratulations to you. In others, I offer my sincere sympathy. I hear my name and ignore it as I crawl through the crisscross of reflective strips. The tape moves not at random, by the way. It genuinely serves as a warning. Whether it's gatekeeping sections currently under construction, in repair, or missing, I try not to, but I think that last one has something to do with where the head librarian went. Don't worry about it. My name is not important. So ineffectual that I've forgotten. I hear my name again as I begrudgingly turn on the lamp. Not a lot of help. Just enough light to ensure I don't trip over anything or disturb the shelves. Many sleep here. 
I send off a warning shot from the flamethrower, showing I carry more light than just atop my appetizing head. The flash of flame sends things slithering, but most of those as close to the tape have never been very convicted by nature, so I'm not concerned. There are more listeners and less watchers past the tape, for obvious reasons. Thankfully, they say, I don't have to go too far. I look down at the telling clicking sound to see rocks rolling, some as big as my foot and some as small as the tip of my thumb. The smaller ones move more easily, but all are rolling as if pulled toward a central point. I don't even need the compass, but I glance down at it one more time before stuffing it back into the sack. While I don't have to go too far, things are relative here. Ten steps may be ten thousand. And so even after only a few moments of exploring, I feel acute pressure jamming into my temples. My heart feels like it's being squeezed and my vision blurs. My fingers tingle by the time I'm able to shake the aspirin into my mouth. I chew it, ignoring the sound of my name, my true name, the one only I can hear. You will hear your own as well if you stay here long enough. My vision clears which just means the dark looks sharper, and I sweep another warning R from the flamethrower for good measure. I do this as much because I love the sound as for protection. I also appreciate the warmth. It gets cold here, but in a strange way, which shouldn't surprise you at this point. It's cold like how the first signs of spring show in the early morning do that's only just melted. I can smell and taste the sweat on my upper lip. And it's cold, and then I hear it, a few or a thousand steps later. The breathing sound I've been listening for, the pace of the rocks quickens, and my head is turned down so the helmet light prevents me from tripping over or impeding their journey. A famous author once said, all things serve the beam, and that's as true in this world as it is in the others, except this beam, this beacon, is attached to our lost visitor. I can only hear the rocks, mumblings, and the breathing sound now. The smell is so musty and thick, like the air is full of sweat and dust, like I've stuck my head out the window during a heavily falling rain. If I think hard enough about it, soon I'll be drenched. So I don't, while the rocks are almost a perfect tell, and the listeners too corroborates the evidence. You can never be too sure. Only light can be sure. I take a match from the tiny box, snap it to life, and then blow it out. Tiny smoke tendrils curl and waft until they also follow the same flow as the rocks. Excellent. We've not been led astray. A few or a thousand more steps, and the rocks are gathering down an aisle where the breathing is more like wheezing, like the desperate struggle to take in. Lo and behold, we found them. Poor thing. Judging by the state of her, she got lost early. She's likely been here for most of the day. The book covers her face, consuming her head like a kid on a particularly large popsicle. The pages flutter gently against her too white jaw. The papery quality of her skin and the wanting muscle mass show how little time was on our side. Not a moment to waste. I grabbed the book by the edges of both back and front covers, it's got most of her head inside at this point. Just her earlobes, hair, and edge of her jaw peek out from. Beneath the pages I now grip firmly. The wheezing turns into a moan that turns into a sob. Now, now, I say, and test the hold the book has on its victim. It's snug, too snug to yank like a leech. I need to treat it like a tick, making sure to get the head out. None of these are intended as puns. But it just happens after being surrounded by books and prose for so long. I draw one of the tiny vials strapped in my utility belt and pull the cork out. It smells like nothing to me, but I see the reaction immediately. Our half-consumed explorer moves a bit, her fingers mostly, and I hear a second, tinier moan beneath that of the books. I pour a small amount of the substance into the palm of my hand, and I smooth it gently down the spine of the book. It wails again, and so does the girl, both full of sorrow and reluctance. I feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, so I turn at the hip 
cocked a flamethrower, and sent off a very intentionally long tail of flames. When the feeling subsides, I shrug the weapon back over my shoulder. I use the backs of two knuckles to knock gently on the book cover. It's time to come back now. My apologies. I say, and I mean it. The book and the girl moan again more hollowly, and I can feel the seal, the bond, splitting like a seam. I grip the book again, because these two are stubborn, and have to pry them apart. The color and mass return beneath her skin, and though her eyes are open, they can't see anything. She'll be like that for a while. It's normal. She'll recover. I pour the remaining contents of the bottle down the part of her frazzled blonde hair. Tears fill the empty eyes and drip down her face. Her mouth presses into a thin white line and grimaces so intensely that the flesh folds in multiple layers at the corners of her mouth. Great pain. Even after a thousand years, I still can't help but feel sorry. So I pull her burning head under my chin and rub circles into her back. I'm sorry, dear. I know you've been told otherwise, but this place is a prison and that isn't your story. Yours is still being written, and the one which made you pretty promises is lying and jealous. One day you, if the world is cruel, may yet have a place here. But it's not today, so let's go have a cup of tea. I tell her, as I've told many like her, I've gotten better at it over the years. I used to have to fight with them. Often I'd give up and just keep them safe until the head librarian got back to talk them down. She finally lets out a weak, wheezing breath. I take advantage of the broken seam of her lips and pour a tincture down her throat. I don't even have to look anymore. I can just feel the specific melodies that make each tincture different. It helps that the one I need usually sings a bit louder as a courtesy, and it'll purr like a cat when I've touched my fingers to it. She chokes a bit, but her eyes start to clear. Good enough for now. The back of my neck has another sudden influx of goosebumps. We've overstayed our welcome. It's time to go. I put the book back on the shelf. I don't scold it. Just allow its ache and frustration flow through me. I apologize, but there's no comfort I can give. My words and compassion are meaningless. I've noted the volume and will tell the head librarian. They might be able to soothe it back to sleep. I tap the metal bauble around my neck, and we're back at my desk. I drape the girl onto a nearby love seat that's seen better days, starting the kettle before heading to the broom closet to stash the emergency kit. She'll be fine. People like her, and you, always are. This place was made to help the wanderers and recklessly imaginative, those who can't wrap their heads around the world the way it is and can see the truth of magic between heartbeats and heartbreaks. And people like me and the head librarian, when they so choose to grace us with their presence, keep the place orderly and open for you. And we're here to help guide you back on track if you lose inspiration for your own story. It's the nature of the job, the library itself. What else can you expect from a place full of nooks and crannies that people choose to get lost in?